Order the next speaker for us today, Dr. John Omen, who grew up in Belo, did his MBBS and MD in community medicine from CMC Belo. He has now served for 30 years in the Christian Hospital. He has worked including community health and primary education for a tribal community, besides helping to run a 200-bedded hospital. The learnings and skills gained through the journey are used to contribute to the different circles, including government, NGOs, and mission agencies. It's an honor and a privilege to introduce and welcome Dr. John Owen onto the stage. Good morning and thank you, Joshua and Susan and all at Lead Talks for giving me the opportunity to be here today. I think most of you have, would have preferred that I passed and allow Naveen to do another 20 minutes. Um, but here goes. Um, I realize that uh, I come from a very different place from most, most of you. You guys come from India, I come from Bharat. These are two different countries. Uh, and therefore I'm gonna use mostly pictures to try and tell the story. Um, I'll just be telling stories. And to begin with, I want to try and summarize uh, life uh, as it has been for me. I've just turned 60, and I want to try and put that together. I'm not speaking to the choir. I know there are a lot of people who are already crossed the barriers and reached there. I'm aiming for the fellow in the last row who's saying, yare, yare, mat you know, that's the audience I want to speak to. Right? So, um, this picture is from when my father uh, joined CMC Velo as a chaplain, a uh, Reverend Ace Human. This is back in 64. I was one and a half years old then. I was up in arms then. I was shy then. I'm still up in arms. And if you think I'm shy, then you've got to think again. But this is family where life started. I joined MBBS in 1980 in CMC Velour. Um, most of what I remember from college was not the classes. I figured out a reflex during physiology class. It's called the ischio eyelid reflex. Continuous pressure on the ischial tuberosities causes depression of the eyelids. Basically, I couldn't stay awake in class. I slept through almost every class unless otherwise proved. So all I can remember is basketball. I remember lots of sports the Students' Association and the Student Christian Movement, which is where we learn to try out our faith, chew it, digest it, and come to our philosophy of life. 1991, Mercy and I got married in the college chapel. Mercy was doing her master's in maternity nursing, and I was doing my MD in community health at that time. And then in 1993, we returned to the Christian Hospital Bissam Kotak in Odisha. I say returned because I had originally worked there uh, between 87 and 88. CMC has this terrific system. After you pass your MBBS, they don't give you your certificates till you serve for two years. They call it bond, I call it finishing school. Because passing MBBS and becoming a doctor are totally different things. Uh, and therefore, I managed to get myself sent to Orissa for my second year. To to totally fell for the place. You know, people in Velour think we are sacrificing our lives, serving the poor. We're not sacrificing anything. We're enjoying what we do. And uh, God in his wisdom has given us this opportunity. People pay money to see places like that. We get it for free with a salary as a bonus. So this hospital was started in 1954. It's now 200 bedded. It's part of the Jaipur Evangelical Lutheran Church. Um, 200 beds, five theaters, busy. The biggest hospital for about 150, 200 kilometers radius. Um, it's in the tribal hills of South Odisha, Raigada district, beautiful area. Um, we're into nursing education. We run schools, we do community work. And there's a whole team, about 360 of us, who work there. Mercy's work has been in nursing education. So when we joined, it was, we were training a and uh, 96 started general nursing, 2018 BSc nursing. And so her passion has been to watch young girls from the KBK districts come in, timid and shy, and come out as empowered nurses, going back to their own communities. We take girls only from Odisha, we train them for Odisha. My own work has been in community health. The first time I joined there in 87, there was an epidemic of meningitis. More people died of meningococcal meningitis in our area than of COVID this time. And I realized that for every 100 who got the disease, one came to hospital. I call it the reverse Good Shepherd story. Uh, 99 are lost, one is found, and we are kichikuing with the one 
that was found and missing the 99. Our country, we are people of the numerator, we are very poor at denominators. And therefore, I found that you had to look for the denominator and that's why I did community here. So my first few years were great fun, walking village to village, sometimes 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers. I was living my dream, knapsack, medicines, uh, so much work to do. And I realized quickly that coming, growing up in Tamil Nadu, I had um, got everything on a platter. You guys don't understand how privileged you are to live in this state. You crip, but you don't know what you're talking about. Um, come out north, you'll understand. Uh, so one of the problems with development is that we define development as trying to make other people like us. Yeah? And your definition of the zoo depends on which side of the bars you're on. And therefore, if you really want to make a difference, you have to cross over and develop an insider perspective. We started doing community dreaming sessions with villages, asking villages to dream of where they want to be, what they want to do, and then trying to help them get there. So the dream was that one day everybody will become healthy. One day everybody will be educated. A day will come when there's no more poverty, no more hunger. A day will come when everybody can live with dignity, regardless of class, color, creed, gender, economic status, or education status. And our single biggest barrier when we started was malaria. There's no word to describe the amount of malaria there was. Uh, we tested all our under five children during season. 59% of children were positive for malaria with or without fever. It's just ubiquitous. There was just there's no question. And so we had to evolve a strategy. And what we came out with was what we call the people's movement against malaria. So a lot of my energy in the early years was in empowering communities to control their own malaria. And for that, you have to teach mos mosquito psychology. You know, why does it bite the app? And then work your way around it. And the ideas we developed at that stage subsequently became part of the government and government of Odisha's flagship program called Daman which is to control malaria. This is part of what we did. We were able to get a radical drop in malaria and WHO came running to find out. But dreams have a funny way of going beyond what you imagine. And one village called Kachapaju, their dream was that one day there'll be a collector from our tribe. Engineers, doctors, nurses, teachers. And the leader of the village, Jushi Saraka on the left side there, he told all the young people, shut up. You don't know what you're asking for. We have a school in our village, the teacher comes three days in a year. Independence Day, Republic Day and Saraswati Puja. You study hard, you can become a pun. Don't make irrational dreams. And then he looked at me and said, where did you study? You don't look like you studied in this kind of a school. Give us a school like the one you studied in. I said, no, but it happened. 1998, 16 villages formed an association, the Malcolm Danchilika Sangha. And together with the hospital, we started a school according to their culture, their language, and their uh, thinking. It's Kuvi medium. Kuvi does not have a script, so we use Odia as a script. Grade one to five. But out of the school, except for the doctor and the collector, all the rest have come true in the last 25 years. So when we reached year 20, the community decided to celebrate. They call it the Kude Borsha Porbo, the 20-year festival. And at this festival, this picture kind of symbolizes or summarizes what we do. We dance the dance of life for the people we serve under the canopy of the three mango trees that symbolize the divine. This to me is the game we're playing. And then when your hair grays, they put you into administration inevitably. They assume that gray hair means you know something about admin. It isn't true. But for the next few years, my job was to help design buildings, construct buildings, and help run the hospital. And now, at the age of 60, my primary task is to teach children how to whistle and to grow old with your friends. This is the same Judishri Saraka in the previous picture, where he's like my elder brother, and now we started to look like each other. Last year, our only son, Ashish, got married uh, last February. It was a homemade wedding, from the wedding cards to the cooking to everything was homemade. They were married in our hospital chapel, and then we had dinner with all our friends outside our house. But the next day, the community decided to celebrate. Dancing together, beating the drums, because they said, this is our son. 4,000 people. They sat the couple, Ashu and Ishani, under the mango tree, the same mango tree. And then 4,000 people had lunch. We provided the raw material, and they did the cooking. Three days later, they got us to come back to the village and just to talk. And they asked each of us to say something. And Ashu, when he was asked to say something, he said, in Odia, my friends 
came for my wedding. They came from Chennai, they came from Delhi, they came from Kolkata, they came from Tehran, they came all over. And they all had one question. Why are these people doing this for your wedding? And he said, I had only one word to answer. Nijoro. In Odia, that means Sondam. Apna. I cried that day because that is what we live for. To become part of. And I'm so grateful to a community that accepted us and loved us. We have received much more than we have given. Now, I want to... Uh, that's... Now we live happily ever after. Huh? Okay. Smug. Now, I want to pick up three stories from different points in life and some reflections from that. I put those pictures up because it is very difficult for you to understand that pictures uh, serve far better than words. But let me try and tell, take three stories from this time. The first one is from 15 years before I was born, 1947. My father is an interesting person. Both my parents very interesting people. We're all slightly uh, screw loose. It's nice to be that way. My father was studying theology in Sarampur College uh, in 1947. Partition was on. The Hindu-Muslim riots were on. My father says he's seen blood flowing in the drains in Calcutta. Gandhiji wrote an article in his newspaper called The Harijan. The article was entitled, Where are the Christians? What Gandhiji said was, India needs you. When Hindus and Muslims are killing each other, we need you to come and stand up in between. You're only 2%. You're not a threat to anybody. You talk of love. You talk of reconciliation. Where are you? Where are the Christians? So my father and three of his friends quit college. They went back to Kerala, collected another set of youth with them. 21 of them got together, said goodbye to their families because they said, we are not going to come back alive. But we're going because Gandhiji has called. They went to Delhi, Birla House, and reported to Gandhiji. They said, Gandhiji, you said, where are the Christians? We've come. Tell us what you want us to do. So they were sent to Ambala where there were the Muslim communities which had to shift to Pakistan. They had been looted, raped, pillaged, tortured, and they had to be put on a trains to go to Pakistan. That was their job. Later, they were moved to Kurukshetra, where there were Hindus coming, back, coming from Pakistan. They were raped, looted, tortured, pillaged. And you had to counsel them, put them in tents, and find spaces. This changed, deepened his understanding of Christ. He always talks about what Gandhiji taught me about Christ. And that has affected the way we think as a family. He was a Gandhian and a pastor with no contradiction between the two. So he was a pastor who was not scared to get mud on his hands, but also to combine spirituality. And so my first reflection, which comes from what my parents taught us, all five children, was this. Our calling is to obedience, not necessarily to success. Story two, 1980, I grew up here in Tamil Nadu, so Tamil, I didn't know any Malayana. And so my parents sent all of us for at least two years to Kerala to, so that we can speak the mother tongue. So I did my pre-degree in St. Berkman's College in Chengana Sheri. And um, just before the final exam, my friend Sushil and I, this is before the final exam and your brain is working over time. We'd sit in study time, hiding from the father who, you know, checks the hostel. And we are discussing who am I, what is life, where am I, you know, those kind of questions which come before the final exam. So, Sushil was on a bus in Mahavalikera when an old man got on the bus, cracked a lot of jokes, a lot of shyery. Everybody laughed at his jokes. But when he asked for money, nobody gave him money. So, he cursed everybody in language that I cannot use in a lead talk. And he, just before getting off the bus, he said, when Indra Gandhi and I were born, we were both born naked. Then he told them what to do with their money, which again I cannot repeat here. Ask me afterwards, I'll tell you. So, we, he came back with this line and we sat and talked about it. If the Prime Minister, the beggar and I were born naked, born the same way, why is one a Prime Minister, one a beggar and one a plus two college student? Our whole analysis which went on for the rest of the study holidays finally concluded at this point. We do not belong to ourselves. All that we are, all that we have are a gift from God to be used in the service of others. And this is the only reason I did medicine. I want to do journalism or medicine, 
applied to MCC and Velo and did this. The story number three, this is now 1997. I'm in Bissam we're working in the field. I was training my village health workers on how to conduct a delivery. One of my tribal ladies was pregnant, health worker, Runa Kolaka. She said, sir, when I deliver, will the placenta get stuck inside? Will I bleed? Will I die? I said, no, Runa, you won't. And then she said, sir, if I call you, will you come? I said, sure, I've come to save the world. Sure, just call, I'll be there. As luck would have it, on a Tuesday morning, at eight months of pregnancy, she delivered. I was in another village. I used to start out 7.30 in the morning, come back 8 o'clock at night. Her placenta didn't come out. She bled. She sent her husband to search for me. Uh, he came to the hospital, 23 kilometers walking. He wouldn't talk to anybody else. Waited for me to come back in the evening. Told me she's calling you. We charged to the village at 8 o'clock at night. She had died around 1 or 2 o'clock. She was in Raigamartas. The baby was still uncut. The cord was uncut. I asked them, why didn't you cut the cord? They said, before she died, she said, Johnny will come. My heart broke. I cried my heart out. I realized that with my MDB as an MD, I could do nothing. Not even save a health workers or life in delivery. I almost gave up. But in the tears, in the searching, I found myself saying to God, Lord, I can't change the world. I can't beat the system. Just give me the strength to share the pain, like you did. And so our reflection three, our calling is to share the pain of people. We change, they change, the situations are transformed. And so if I try to summarize these stories and the lessons that come down over the 60 years, lesson number one that I want to share with you, God is real, God is good, God is faithful. Some of you out there must be wondering whether he's a psychotherapy job. I have wondered that many, many times, a good psychotherapy job. But I've been there, I've stepped off the cliff, I found his hands underneath. I assure you, God is real, God is good, God is faithful, you can trust and walk. Lesson two, we do not belong to ourselves. All that we are, all that we have are a gift from God to be used for those who did not get the opportunities we got. Don't take it lightly. Lesson three, it isn't easy, but it's worthwhile. That's the choice. Me, I choose worthwhile anytime. I also want to focus on the key values that Lead Talks talks about. Purpose, integrity, excellence. But may I suggest, in my reflection, that the art of life is striving for a dynamic equilibrium between seemingly opposite forces. The critical paradoxes of life. You know, if you take any position of the hand, this professor of anatomy is sitting here, I have to be careful here. Um, but I like the way Sally, when you read out professor of anatomy, you called him professor of, professor of autonomy. That's a nice one. But anyway, so if you look at the position of the hand, any position you take is a balance between the flexors and the extensors. That's how it is with life. So let me take purpose, or the word I prefer is purposefulness. Pitch your tent in the battlefield. Stay the course. Do not run away when the going gets tough. And yet, do not be so committed to the task that you cannot hear him who assigned you the task. There is a time to let go and move on in obedience when he calls you to. On integrity, stay true. Do not compromise yourself, for then there is nothing left. We can fool the world. You can fool others. You can fool yourself, but you can't fool God. And ultimately, we will have to answer to him. And yet, Saints can be very difficult to live with. As we walk through life trying to balance our halos on our heads, we can be a pain to our colleagues and to our families. Integrity has to be balanced with love, with graciousness, and with compassion. And on excellence, strive for situational excellence. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, ask yourself, is this the best we can do in the given situation? Raise the bar, push the standards, and yet we must equally strive for social relevance. Will this actually make a difference to the poor? To the last man in the line, as Gandhiji would say, pursuit of excellence without relevance makes us ivory towers of irrelevance. Pursuit of relevance without excellence cultivates mediocrity unbecoming of people 
of divine inspiration. It's both and, not either or. Thank you, and to God be the glory. While you were sitting there, Joshua and I said, uh, when you go up there, please ensure that you ask the audience to give a standing ovation. As you can see, there is no need for that. Let's give a round of applause to Anna and to Doctor. And I'd like to request his wife, uh, Mercy, if you could also come on stage, please, wherever you are. One day when we get to heaven, it'll be a scene like this where you'll have many people who've served God. You'll know a lot of their names. They'll be famous people. But then God will start calling out names and there'll be names you never knew. There'll be people whose work you've never heard of. This is an example of that, that we'll see one day again in heaven. Thank you so much, Doctor, for everything you've done. We can see each other before we reach heaven also. <laughs> he has a perfect balance of seriousness and funny as well. So uh, we'd like to recall Alfred Uncle and Rebecca to hand over the memento to doctor. And a well-deserved uh, inscription is healing hands. So if doctor and mercy, auntie could 